In the spirit of reconciliation, Law Squared acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hello and welcome to Tackling Psychosocial Hazards in 2024, presented by Law Squared. I'm your host today, Law Squared's Chief Legal Officer, Kate Marshall. Ensuring a safe working environment is a responsibility that we all now have, and it extends beyond that physical safety to include the psychological safety. And the spotlight on this issue and how employers are managing these types of risks has never really been more intense as corporates begin to recognise the impact of these hazards on their employees. I think for all of us, it's relatively easy to identify the need to manage the physical uh, workplace issues. But looking more broadly to the impacts of the psychosocial issues, for me, feels a bit more complex. Um, it requires a rethinking of the way that we approach health and safety frameworks. So we're thinking about that true duty of care towards employees, not just the kind of obvious stuff that we can see straight in front of us. So today we have a, a really great group of experts who share their insights on building safer workplaces and the repercussions of neglecting these really important aspects. So joining us are Culture Amp's General Counsel and Company Secretary, Sarah Tinsley, Employment Lawyer at Law Squared, Andrew Brooks, and Shihan Pires, People Risk Partner and Psychologist at Howden. They're gonna provide real life stories um, discuss some of the recent legislative changes in this space um, and share their practices for addressing the root causes of psychosocial hazards and how we can foster some systemic change. So whether you're an in-house legal professional, a people and culture expert, or responsible for people management, this webcast is going to be really important viewing. Together, we'll explore those practical steps to create happier, healthier, and safer workplaces. First up, I'd like to introduce Sarah Tinsley, who is an experienced general counsel and company secretary at CultureAmp, a tech technology startup founded in Melbourne with employees based in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Berlin, and London. CultureAmp developed the leading employee feedback platform and actively engages with employees to improve work workplace culture across more than seven and a half thousand companies worldwide. We use it here at Law Squared, and I'm sure many of our viewers' organisations will too. Sarah was previously the General Counsel and Business Affairs Director for the Australian Radio Network and held previous roles as Senior Counsel at Fairfax Media and General Counsel and Company Secretary at Nova Entertainment, a media and broadcast group owned by Lachlan Murdoch. So I'm really pleased to have you with us here today, Sarah. Really glad to be here, Kate. And this is, um, this is a topic that um, I think is really important and I, I feel very passionate about. So excited to um, get into some meaty dis discussion. Fabulous. I'm also delighted to be joined by a great friend of Law Squared, that's Xi'an Pires, who's the Howden's partner in People Risk. Xi'an brings 18 years of experience in enterprise risk management and organisational psychology to this discussion and leads Howden's psychological risk management solutions across the Pacific. Xi'an excels in developing large scale psychological interventions and has led preventative initiatives protecting workforces across the world. His published work in moving from psychosocial risk to ESG um, showcases his ability to create scalable systemic solutions for people around the world. Awesome, awesome Jack. Great to have you with us today, Xi'an. Thanks, Kate. That was a great introduction. And, um, you know, really pleased to be part of such a great diverse panel that can bring that insight to um, your diverse audience as well. Fabulous. And finally, um, someone that many of our viewers will be familiar with, Andrew, or as we call him, Andy Brooks. He's our employment and workplace relations lawyer here at Law Squared. 
And Andrew has worked extensively as a legal advisor to many of our clients, both across the not-for-profit and the for-profit sectors. He's the co-author of the Child Safety Toolkit, which has been downloaded over 100,000 times, wow, um, and aims to prevent child abuse in community organisations. Andrew is also the driving force behind a whole library of free resources that are published by Law Squared and at helping organisations comply with employment legislation and emerging trends in the workplace. These include things like the family and domestic violence leave policy, uh, the artificial intelligence in the workplace policy, and most recently, the right to disconnect policy template. Prior to becoming a lawyer, um, Andrew worked as a personal carer for Australian Home Care for over five years and is passionate about supporting differently abled people in our communities live prosperous and fulfilling lives. Great to have you with us, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Kate. Good to be here. Okay, now before we leap, leap into the detail, a quick word on some housekeeping just to help us keep on time. We're going to take questions in the chat bar. Um, I expect we'll cover them in the course of our chat today, but if there's something that we don't manage to get to or run out of time, we'll send you through some more detailed answers and resources in the coming days. Um, please don't be shy, drop us your questions in the sidebar and our chat moderator, Lisa, will make sure that one way or another we'll get back to you on this. So let's get straight into it. Um, I think we probably need some context. Um, Andrew, I'm going to turn to you uh, as our resident employment law expert. Can you just start by providing some background for people like me who are not so familiar with psychosocial hazards? What do they encompass and how do they differ from other workplace oh &S type laws? Yeah, happy to, Kate. It sounds like a new term, psychosocial hazards. It kind of has this... Uh, like it will come up on Google Alerts or something we've never heard of before. But it, largely it's talking about something that we should have been caring about for, you know, over 100 years in terms of protecting our workplace and staff. Um, the way I kind of see it is um, instead of just oh &S looking after physical safety, uh, we're really looking at mental wellbeing as well. So we're expanding, I guess, the traditional concept of oh &S to take into account other factors that, again, we re really should be thinking about um, already, but now we're actually bringing it into our legislation and codes of practice. So we're, I guess, being a bit smarter or more sophisticated in how we talk about safety. Um, but arguably the same kind of obligations are still there. So we're still our duty of care to everyone that comes on um, into our office or workplace to make sure that they're safe and well. Um, it's just now where um, I'm sure Shahan uh, can talk to it a lot more in terms of the, the ISOs and the different codes of practice that come into it. Um, but largely, we're just becoming a bit smarter in terms of how we're thinking about it to look after not just an employee's physical safety necessarily, but also looking after their mental well-being as well. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Shihan, um, perhaps you could give us your thoughts on, on what's really driving these changes and particularly bringing in a legislative requirement around psychosocial hazards. And I suppose how's that playing out for employee well-being? Yeah, thanks, Kate. And, um, you know, sort of to pick, piggyback off what Andrew had shared, you know, as a psychologist, I've been treating people that have sustained psychological injuries as a result of poor workplace practices for over a decade. And after that decade of treating people, um, you know, at least about 15 years ago, we started to think about how we actually change the system of work and um, create safer work environments for people to be in. So rather than being so reactive and um, just providing things like support and recovery, we've really moved upstream into preventing and protecting people. Um, and I think uh, policies, procedures, you know, some of the stuff that Caltrain might do in terms of identifying hazards and risks, that sort of is a pathway of doing that. But the transition um, that's happened globally really reinforces that prevention and that protection of humans right on the planet and it puts that responsibility back onto employers and um, leaders of those organizations in order to be able to create safer systems of work so we really welcome the codes of practice but as andy has shared um, legislation has been in place for a long period of time to protect human beings in organizations 
the codes just clarify how we do it and uh, you know and getting smarter about how we actually accomplish that yeah it, it sounds like for some people uh, this can be quite a traumatic outcome so is the intent to avoid that happening in the first place yeah exactly um, you know if you think about some of the impacts on our schemes as a country we're lucky enough to have um, things like workers' compensation schemes that actually support people once they're ill and injured. Um, there's lots of countries that we deal with around the world where those schemes don't even exist. Um, but we cannot just continue to pour money into these schemes. And there are schemes all around Australia um, that are, you know, um, leading deficits, right, because of poor management of just support and recovery but also lack of investment in the prevention and protection of people. Um, so, you know, I'm really proud of our government as they've stepped up and actually created one of the first harmonised changes, I think, globally, <laughs> which is a really great place for us to start. Yeah. Well, perhaps, Andrew, you could take us through um, what does that legal regime actually look like? Um, is it a, a serious issue for people um, who are responsible for compliance in this area, the people and culture team, the GCs. Perhaps tell us a bit more detail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to piggyback again, so obviously states and territories can never agree. Uh, so in line with some other areas, um, each state has taken a slightly different approach to psychosocial hazards. So nearly all of them have or are producing codes of practice for their in particular state or territory. And there is a lot of overlap, to be honest. A lot of them follow the same kind of guidance overseas. Uh, but technically speaking, if you're a GC of a national um, business, uh, you're looking technically at all the different states and territories you have employees and trying to comply or take guidance from those codes of practice. So while I can tell you that New South Wales is pretty good in terms of how strict and how much information they provide and that if you comply with New South Wales, you're probably going a fair way for every state and territory. Um, technically, like OHS, it is a state and territory based um, piece of legislation, which um, is great for employment lawyers that need to, you know, um, make a living out of interpreting kind of complex schemes, um, slightly more difficult for in-house councils that are juggling um, 10,000 different things. So uh, I guess in my perspective, um, a lot of those obligations from a legal perspective, so you uh, legislative and common law duty of care, um, that is nationwide. So that applies in every state. Um, also in every state is the potential for personal liability for our leaders, um, uh, senior leaders uh, generally, or anyone really that has the ability to influence safety in the workplace. Um, that is an obligation, an increased obligation that they owe or on the flip side, an increased risk um, that they also need to share. So the good or bad thing with OHS, including the psychosocial hazards, are you can't contract out of or delegate out your responsibilities. Um, and every individual has an obligation in terms of this. Um, so yes, it's all well and good to have an OHS committee and, and try to push everything onto them. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, it's actually on all of us to take responsibility for it. So we can't um, just delegate it to someone else. So in terms of what um, those liabilities are, um, obviously the regulators try to make it as scary as possible to try to encourage or prevent uh, breaches. So each state has something slightly different, but if, for example, to be persuasive, I take the maximum of all the different states, uh, Queensland has a maximum penalty of up to $10 million um, for a breach and also um, has up to um, a potential for up to 10 years imprisonment um, so I will flag, I know lawyers like to throw out a number and just leave it hanging. Um, those sort of maximums, um, and also they're normally only triggered if there is an actual death in the workplace caused by the negligence. So there are like lots of different eligibility criteria that are met for that. Um, but if we're trying to use language to convince our managers or even the CEO, other exec leaders, um, why we should care about this space, sometimes we find those kind of big scary numbers to be useful. Um, to just incentivize or, or give language to why we should care about it. Because obviously the aim is to actually prevent injury and, you know, touch wood, we never have major accidents in our workplace. Um, but yeah, there will be that one manager that needs to feel personally impacted. Um, care and I think imprisonment sometimes is a pretty easy one to um, perk there is. Thanks, Andrew. And look, Sheehan, you mentioned uh, that you were pleased with uh, the government's getting involved in this space. Just before we uh, bring Sarah into the conversation, I'm interested um, 
from the both of you, Andrew and Shihan, where do we kind of sit at a global level? Is Australia ahead of the game, lagging behind? Where are we? I guess being Australian, we're always going to, you know, walk out of an Olympic stadium with the flag right out front. A key part of, um, I guess, the changes that have happened globally are also, um, you know, have to be credited to uh, to countries like Canada um, and Australia and, you know, also work that's been done in the UK from the, the healthcare sector and the private healthcare sector as well. Um, but I guess for Australia to set out in front and, um, you know, put a line in the sand um, from a legislative perspective and to introduce codes of practice, um, as Andrew shared, you know, those penalties across the organisation has really demonstrated that we've changed the game. Um, now, Howden operates in over 100 countries um, and, you know, we have over 16,500 staff across those regions and, and um, you know, through consultation with those teams, we have a really clear picture that um, other countries such as um, the UAEs, um, the UK, Europe, um, the European Union, um, also in Asia are starting to shift their perception on the importance of reinforcing management of this, but they're still not up to speed with where we are in Australia. Most European countries are taking still the perspective of a employee benefit and a well-being initiative as opposed to a risk mitigation um, initiative. Yeah, interesting. Well, perhaps a um, good point to bring Sarah into the conversation uh, because I'm conscious, Sarah, you have that dual role. You've got the general counsel company secretary hat on where you're going to be looking at these issues from a a legal perspective and a compliance perspective, but you're also part of an organisation where, you know, positive company culture is so critical and and, and important to Culture Amp. Can you give us, um, I suppose, a picture of, of how you manage these issues within Culture Amp? Yeah, we, we call it customer zero, Kate, and that's that's us as the customer, but also um, hopefully part of the solution. It's an interesting one. Obviously, um, we hold ourselves to high standards and we have to because of who we are and what we do, but we're also not perfect. So we're learning and growing and, and dealing with humans just like we all are um, and want to make sure that we're addressing that, you know, uh, authentically. Um, and I think that's kind of key to a tool like ours um, and there are many, um, it really comes down to how you use it and the data that you gather, what you do with that data and how you're able to use that um, both to meet your compliance obligations but also to move the needle in a positive direction with your people and to build trust, to build consistency, which is really big, um, and to build that goodwill and safety that we're all looking for to, to really um, build your wellbeing. Um, we do that in a bunch of different ways. So we do use our own tool really extensively. And one of the things that I love about what we do is that we've been doing it consistently for a really long time. And I think the richness and the patterns in that data over time is really valuable. Um, it's not always how sexy the questions are and how often you change them, it's actually that consistency of message and of feedback that I find is, is really valuable. Um, we do have policies and procedures in place as uh, most of us as GCs uh, will have with our people teams. Um, I'm a GC who doesn't love too many policies. I like really good policies that we use and that we stand by rather than lots of them. So we take a lot of time in the way we develop our policies and we try to think them through from every angle. Um, and we also try to make sure that they're delivered in a tone that is consistent with how we communicate across the whole company. Um, we all will have seen, um, particularly with these sorts of areas that are technically tricky, when the company communicates in a certain way and legal communicates in a different way. Um, and I find that you can, you know, that'll instill some fear for sure and maybe some accountability because of that, but it's not really going to resonate. It's not really going to hit the spot. So if you can do that in a way that gets your message across and doesn't dilute the seriousness of it, but also 
is authentic and delivered in the voice of your company, um, I think that's a plus. Um, yeah, and, and the final thing for me would be that employee wellbeing has been the domain of the HR team for a really long time, and that's changing and it has to change. Um, and this legislation is an example of why that needs to change, but there are many others. Um, and I would argue that, you know, on top of the legal consequences around breaches to the new legislation, I think the reputational risk at this point is also really significant. And whilst you know, that doesn't always um, deliver the best message, I think it's important for executive teams and boards um, to really get across this and to own it and to share that accountability um, or, you know, the consequences from a reputational shareholder perspective are, are really big. Mm. Yeah, really fantastic advice there, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. And I agree with you. Your tool, I think the ability to, to see the data and the patterns over time, understand the gaps and the progress or lack of progress that has been made across the organisation is incredibly useful. But Shihan, I, I wanted to turn to you uh, with your psychologist lens. Uh, perhaps we can explore the connection between managing psychosocial hazards and the overall employee well-being. How does a healthy and safe workplace impact employee engagement, I suppose, um, productivity, some of those other metrics that we love to focus on. Yeah, um, I guess I might take our viewers back to a project that they can Google. And the project that they can Google is Google's Project Aristotle. And Project Aristotle was one of the first projects that was done around actually Google looking at its own employees and looking at well-being factors that relate um, to leading high-performing teams. Right? And if you think about the war on talent in the tech industry, that was you know a pioneering initiative to try and ensure that they retained their talent, um, but they also found out what factors actually mitigate the risk of talent leaving. And across their whole evaluation, across the whole of the organisation, the number one ranked um, factor was that perception of psychological safety within the work environment. And if you think about, um, you know, one of the highest performing teams in the world, we sort of look at the the Googles of the world. And um, and I think looking inwards, um, similar to like what Sarah has said as well, has been the critical first feature that we need organisations to um, do, right? So from a psychologist's perspective, self-awareness is the biggest first step that we can take right? and so whether i'm working with a patient or working with an organization if there is no self-awareness then there is no self-regulation right? and to really think about how self-aware our teams are our leaders are our organization is there are great tools like the ones that sarah is talking about as well in terms of increasing that level of self-awareness but they can't be just tools that we use once every year to be able to check the health and well-being of our people. There needs to be integration of tools that we can apply regularly. Um, and there's plenty of digital resources and tools out there. We also need to think about um, self-regulation, right? So moving from, okay, I realise that things have changed within me. How can I actually regulate my behaviour? If you go back to the acts, Andy will tell you that in the act, it is a responsibility of a leader to, you know, ensure their acts and emissions don't actually impact on their workforce, right? So it, it's written there clear as day in the act from a regular, regulatory perspective. And when we think about self-regulation, um, that's a key feature of leadership capability and leadership behaviour that, um, that's been missed, right? fairly technical, I need to achieve this, I'm a you know leader in this space, I'm technically savvy, I've been promoted through the organisation and I'm a high performer, but have I got those people skills to be able to empower and enrich the work experience of people? Mm. Yeah, that's a fascinating uh, area, Shihan, and I suppose opening it up to Sarah and Andrew, 
do you see that there is a gap in the workforce around teaching some of those skills, being able to be self-reflective, to be able to self-regulate uh, what it means to be a leader these days? Uh, or are these things that can actually be taught? What's your thoughts? I, I definitely think they can be. And I think education in this space is something that even if it does already exist, um, it should always exist and it should be ongoing. Um, we're all on a journey, I think, as leaders and um, humans change and evolve with us. So I think education is really important. Um, I also think that, you know, every company is at a different stage on this journey and evolution. And, you know, there are some that would come to us that I would be really reluctant because we're going to ask the question for you, but do you really want to know the answer? And what are you going to do with the information once you get it? Um, and it's really important that, if to, to Sheehan's point, if, if you're going to seek data and information, that you have a plan in place to address it and to deal with it. And some of that is going to potentially be uncomfortable or difficult. So we work really hard behind the scenes. Um, you know, we're a, a software tool, but we have a large number of people scientists and psychologists behind the scenes that are there to help coach around actions and around next steps. Um, and we also, uh, you know, work with uh, and, and encourage our customers to work with external legal and consultants to help them to, to map out the pathway to manage the risks in Sheehan space and or to mitigate any immediate dangers or issues that come up. Um, but again, some people are more ready to do that than others. But I think, you know, legally they need to be more ready and morally they need to be more ready. And that's the education piece that I think needs to sit alongside all of these tools and other um, mechanisms we have to, to manage the risk. Mm. Andrew, are you finding that there's a little bit of lawyering and a little bit of uh, perhaps coaching um, and supporting? Yeah, I think so. And I think um, I think it's very difficult to advise in this space as a lawyer without first acknowledging um, how much we suck as an industry and historically how bad we are as lawyers in this space. It's no surprise a lot of the regulators at the moment, in particular in Victoria, are actually going after legal bodies, which um, obviously shocks a lot of people because they think who should know the law better than lawyers or judges or courts. Um, but unfortunately, we're some of the worst um, perpetrators in this space in terms of... Um, burnout in terms of putting unfair workloads on individuals not resourcing correctly. Um, from my understanding, what I see is that a lot of the time, um, if we're the leaders and we're very busy, uh, it can be hard for us sometimes to think about someone else's busyness when we're, when we might consider that we're actually the one that's um, most at risk of these issues. So we find it hard to do that. Um, I don't think it's also that um, uncommon, but uh, in the legal industry as well, we often uh, increase and, and go up the ranks based on our um, legal skills, uh, not necessarily based on our management skills. And I think that flows through to a lot of different industries where we're quite good at the thing that we studied for um, and we just get put into positions of responsibility and management without actually getting trained in any capacity to be good at that. Um, and I think we're seeing that a lot with our clients. We're seeing the education piece isn't necessarily always on the employee to disclose issues. It's actually trying to educate managers to look out for and prevent issues uh, and then also to spot issues before they turn into something. So I was speaking to a client today and they were um, trying to educate managers to be on the lookout for hours being worked each week or particular signs in which they could look out for um, to try to uh, stop an issue from kind of snowballing to something more just because HR teams um, by very design they can't be on top of every hour that every employee works it actually is a responsibility of management to kind of be on that um, and be a bit more proactive so yes sometimes managers are the most defensive when we say that it's something that they could do better uh, but I think we just have to be humble and take that on that that is just a modern day reality that we need to be better at um, and the managers that can take that on and are actually supportive and beneficial to their staff will succeed. And I think in 10 years' time, hopefully we've gotten rid of a lot of the managers that have just worked first. Um, but, yes, interesting space, um, especially with the new right to disconnect laws as, as well coming in. Um, another issue that seems to have quite an emotional reaction on managers and leaders, um, but 
which when you boil it down to is really just making sure that we're not asking employees to do something that's unreasonable. Um, but it just sounds very um, critical uh, and we just need to be better at taking those advice or guidance, I guess. Mm, mm. Um, Sarah, while we're on both managers and leadership, can you tell us about your experience at Culture Amp? Um, is this type of issue being discussed at the executive level? Is it being discussed at the board level? You know, what steps are being taken at that very senior leadership level to manage these types of issues? Yeah, for us, it certainly is. Um, and it's, it's core to, to so much of what we do. So that probably makes a lot of sense. One thing that um, our chief people officer has driven, um, which I really like, is a sort of a template board deck for HR around what is it that your board want to know. It's not driven with a specific legal lens. Um, I wanted to get more involved in it, but I stepped back and let it um, be HR driven, which I think is really important. Um, and it highlights the metrics and the issues that he feels um, as the CPO of Coltramp, he wants his board to know about. Um, and it's a really great document. Um, and I know he's spoken at the Institute of Company Directors about it, which is really awesome. Um, so we do have a lot of information that flows up to our board, um, more than some companies would feel comfortable with, I think. Um, but, you know, we, ha we have a transparent culture and what we do is culture. So that's really important to us. But I talking more generally both for us and for you know a lot of our customers um, it, managers and leadership want to understand one because they understand the liability is there now um, whether it always was or not beside the point but I think they also understand that this stuff is the key to you know better performance and there's lots of data to support that now, that you have a, a highly engaged and in workforce with high well-being, you will perform better. And they want that. So how do they get it? Um, so absolutely, I think you've got a lot more interest. You've still got a mixed bag when it comes to skills and education level and natural ability. So, so I think the education piece is really important. Um, but helping to arm people with the tools, executives with the tools um, to lean in to that curiosity and to that accountability um, is a really important thing and a good opportunity. Um, and for us, like any other company, we have executives who are better at this stuff than others, um, who to whom it comes really naturally and others to whom it doesn't. Um, and again, I think we've all experienced behind the scenes, you know, you have a really great team of HR and legal working lockstep to coach your executives and give them the guidance that they need to, to help them to make the right decisions um, and to make sure that we take all the learnings and we debrief and we talk about it um, so we continually improve and we call out the areas where we really could have done better. I think that's really important as well. Mm. Yeah, I love the idea of uh, legal and HR being in lockstep and so uh, important. supporting guiding, uh, educating. Uh, and while we're on the, the topic of education, uh, I suppose looking at um, your experience and background, Sarah, have you got any tips um, or potential pitfalls for others that are starting to, to go through that learning education guidance role? What should they do a bit more of and anything that they should try to avoid? Oh, it's as a GC, you know, one of the joys of my job and also one of the pains is the stakeholder managers um, and dealing with, you know, amazing executives who are all brilliant at what they do, but are all different when it comes to this stuff. Um, so that's a great challenge for me um, and I love it, um, but it also sometimes keeps me up at night. So um, I, I think as a new GC in a company, get to know your stakeholders, understand what makes them tick, understand what's important to them and their values, because this is all very values driven, both company and also individual. Um, and I think you can be a better advisor if you understand what it is that, that they think success looks like, um, whether you're aligned on that or not. Um, and I think 
when you really understand the lay of the land for your key stakeholders, then um, you can you can help to guide their journey. Um, and also to understand from a board perspective or an executive team perspective, where can you add the most value? Where can you come in and, and, and help that education piece, whether it's working with, so our CPO and I will, will collude together on who do you think we should bring in to talk about this? If we're talking about psychosocial risks, should we get the lawyers in? Is that the message that they're going to hear? Or should we look at a consultant or bring in someone who's going to deliver it through play or through humour or through another means? Um, and we do work together to try to meet the business where it's at. Um, and I'd say we do that um, sort of similarly with the customers of Culture App because every business is different. Some of them have been through massive change and transformation, and that's going to um, erode psychosocial safety in a different way to a company that's been very consistent for decades. Um, and so how you approach your surveying and, and the questions that you ask your employees are going to be different. So the more you can understand and delve into the business and its values, its recent journey and history, um, the better your outcome will be. Kate, I was just going to just um, ask Sarah a, a bit more um, of the question in relation to something that she talked about from the board and officer um, due diligence perspective. Sarah, do you, do you see it as a GC's responsibility to facilitate, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a general counsel in the house, um, that due diligence piece um, for the board? I think, well, as company secretary, I do. Yeah, um, there is definitely some responsibility there. Um, I think it's it directors um, hold their own responsibility, ultimately, for sure. Um, but I think there's a facilitation role there that COSEC can play. Um, and it can come down to the materials that you provide to your board directors when they come on board initially and making sure that that's comprehensive and that you talk them through it. So it's really nice to see, and I hear more and more of this now, of people saying to me, we saw your data, your Coltramp data in our board meeting. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, so that's happening a lot and that's really important. Um, but I also think that, you know, like any data, understanding it and getting into the detail can be really helpful. So either I will do that or offer to do that, or I direct them to our people team who are the experts and will do a better job than I can. Yeah. And, and I was also thinking more from, you know, Andy had talked about um, the fines and the impact as well. Yeah. You know, working in an insurance broker, um, I understand the policies have changed now and cover doesn't extend um, to jail time and fines. Um, and also, you know, legal fees are going to be impacted by changes um, in, you know, in the, in the sort of um, insurance world, right? So I don't know whether Andy has any further to comment on that, but um, really think about those implications. And Andy, we talk a lot about that as well. You know, how, how downstream does that actually flow um, to uh, the conversations that we're having with boards and and um, directors as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I might just add, uh, sometimes when we talk to people and they're worried about, um, they're only worried about finances and there are some personality types that we deal with that that is their main criteria and they might say, well, we have insurance that will cover all of those risks. Um, but unfortunately, there are just realities to insurance that it doesn't cover everything and by design it doesn't cover imprisonment. In fact, it's not sure how, how you could cover that. Um, it also can't cover um, a lot of different penalties when they're actually caused by negligence, which is oftentimes the sort of claims that we see here. Um, we also all know in Australia that um, if you get claims under your workers' comp insurance, your premiums go up. Um, we also know from a cost perspective that uh, when someone is out with a mental health injury claim on workers' comp, um, less than 50% return within six months. So when we're getting these mental health injury claims, people just aren't returning or they're returning after a very long time. So what we see sometimes is the first person will go off. Um, they won't hire into that role because they're not sure. They'll put all their duties onto someone else or the rest of the team. That team will get incredibly stressed and overworked. Someone else may lodge a workers' comp claim. And so, yes, you might see it just as, the original claims covered by insurance, but when you start thinking about insurance premiums or you're thinking about other employees that are stressed or less productive now, you can actually see just there's a cost um, consequence, I guess, that people don't consider. So again, if we're trying to think of 
different leaders having different motivations or different um, personality traits, it's good to know that there are different ways in which you potentially would be able to persuade them that this is a serious issue. So yes, imprisonment is great for one, but even just for a CFO or a finance team, um, they hate insurance premiums going up because there are additional claims. So a great way to avoid that is actually preventing the claim or injury from happening. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting. This is one of those topics that you can kind of pull from where you need um, to try to create an argument. Mm. Is there anything that we should be particularly looking out for? Maybe this is a, a question for you, Shian, um, no. or it could be Andrew and Sari, you've got a perspective. Uh, but psychos psychosocial hazards encompasses such a broad range of issues. If I'm concerned about my team, are there any tips, anything that I should be particularly looking out for that might give me a hint that something else is going on? Yeah, I think I think the best way to you know make that diagnosis. Let's use you know a medical model, unless we do an X ray or a scan or any sort of, sort of thematic. Just you know, going on a whim that I think that bone's broken is is probably not good enough, right? Um, we have the technology and we have the insight and the resources. You know, we have some amazing tools out there that we can use to be able to assess what might be happening. Um, and we then need to go in and actually have conversations with our frontline teams about what we've found. So the consultation process, I think, if you look at the Safe Work Australia guidelines. Um, and the code, you know, there's there's a paragraph on how to run consultation. And I think that's a critical aspect that um, our leaders miss, um, our health safety representatives can do better. Um, and we need to drive that consultation with our frontline teams that are most at risk, right? Um, and let's not think about all the psychosocial hazards. Let's just pick the top two or three that are priority risk areas that we know in our hearts are going to impact our workforce, right? So if you have a workforce that's in a contact centre now in any finance um, or banking organisation, they're likely to be receiving hardship calls, okay? So think about the implications of your entire workforce that has to, um, you know, process those calls or claims, whatever it may be, but also may not have the mechanisms around them to debrief and de-escalate those difficult situations or manage um, you know, challenging situations even as they arise. And thinking about that early intervention, unless you, again, go down on the shop floor and assess that with your teams, you're not going to be able to intervene early to mitigate those risks. So, yes, we can build you know, grand prevention plans to mitigate those risks, but those can be very simple action plans that are driven by leaders every day. Well, perhaps, um, Sarah, I'll turn to you because you can use data from your uh, CultureAmp surveys and the tool that you have uh, to help identify, I suppose, what could be actual or potential psychosocial risks and hazards. How does that actually work in practice. Can you give me a bit more context there? Sure. Well, there's a, a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, you can incorporate psychosocial safety questions into your regular surveying, into your pulse surveys to your employees. Um, and most people do that in some way, shape or form already, whether they have consciously done it that way or not. So that's helpful. Um, and we do have discrete psychosocial wellbeing check-in surveys that can be run themselves and that really focus on areas that are um, key to identifying general risks but then should be tailored to the individual company and to exactly what um, what Shan was just talking about around you know what do we know about the company what do we know about the workforce how and then how can we approach them to hopefully draw out the most um, poignant information to then uh, act on appropriately. Um, so it does come down to, to questions that may look quite simple, but do um, are developed, you know, by psychologists and designed to draw out the information that will help to guide the next steps. Um, but I also think it's more than any tool. It's it's as Shian said. It's con it's consultation. It's being present. 
It's asking people how they're doing and listening to the answer and taking that minute to do so. Um, and I think that um, is incredibly impactful. And I think that, you know, workforces notice, employees notice. Um, and I know with my team who are global, so we're all working around the clock, we're not all working the same hours because of time zones, um, that human um, touch points that we have as a team are invaluable to all of us, myself included. Um, and just knowing that when there's an issue, they're not afraid to come straight to me and tell me about it, good, bad or ugly, um, I'm very grateful for. Um, it's always the most ill opportune time. I'm always exhausted. I have three other things on my plate and a board meeting happening the next day. Um, but that's what I'm here for and that's my job and, and you know, super important to, to recognise that. Um, and that's one tiny example and obviously everyone's different. But, um, yeah, so the tool I think um, will arm companies with really helpful information um, I think developing the muscle around gathering that information over time is important. I think understanding what to do with the information even more important. And we've seen articles in the press recently about companies who have gathered information and haven't acted on it. And that's taking you down one illegally precarious pathway in this space, but also um, just a, a really bad road from a well-being perspective, from a you know shareholder perspective, from a reputational perspective. So I do think the um, the message around you know yeah don't, don't go down this path unless you are willing to take steps. And as a lawyer. Um, I think um, as a person, I would tell you to do it, but as a lawyer, you do need to be ready um, and have resources around you to support you with what you get back. Yeah, great insight. And I love the idea of building that uh, trust with your team so they feel comfortable to come to you uh, in those moments where they're perhaps not feeling quite so safe at work. I think it's the little um, thing, Kate. Right? I do. Mm, I think that they matter. Yes, particularly in a re remote working environment, which we exist in as well. Yep. Mm. Mm. Yep. And Shihan, can you yep. tell us about the tool that you use, the Leadership in Psychosocial Risk Management tool? How do you use yeah. that? How to yeah, so Kate, and I don't think um, there's an organisation or a leader out there that is in business right now because they don't want to be successful in what they're doing, right? We know that there's organisations um, and leaders out there that might be just performing or making you know, or getting by, but still um, they, they want to be successful. They want to achieve success in every aspect of what they're doing. Um, and I guess what we're um, also driving out there is a consolidated way of building the capability of those leaders and setting the expectation that leadership in a modern age has certain KPIs around it, right? And I guess there's no point getting out there and scaring leaders and saying, look, we're gonna we're gonna put KPIs around well being and performance without actually teaching them how to achieve those KPIs. So we've partnered with um, Bond University in Queensland to be able to create a leadership in psychosocial risk management. Um, now I know Bond has a very significant reputation in the legal sector as well. Um, so lots of graduate lawyers from Bond. And the the eLearn module that we've just created with them takes a university um, lens as well as a risk management lens to it and just creates that expectation for leaders around, you know, how the legislation has changed and what's coming, but also what's the expectation um, for behaviour change and, and how can they actually get there. So, um, you know, have a look at that. That's a really great, great pathway for people to actually, you know, do a micro-credential with Bond University and, and, and build, you know, leadership in psychosocial risk management. But I, I, I sort of want to get our GCs and audience and, um, you know, people on the line to start to think about, well, if we're setting KPIs for organisational performance because we want it to be successful and we want X number of units sold or X number of customers engaged, why haven't we set those KPIs around risk management in our workplace? Right? And would it be that hard to actually set 
KPIs around risk management when, as Andy has shared, you know, we can actually see the bottom line costs associated with poor psychosocial risk management in our workplace as well. Um, so I, I feel like over the next five to 10 years in Australia, that's where the biggest shift is probably going to come from. And, um, you know, if you're progressing your career through different organisations, wouldn't the next organisation you're going to want to see your risk profile as a leader? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I love the idea of bringing this into leadership capability and certainly uh, in the profession that I'm in, we could do with a lot more of it. So I welcome that. Um, perhaps if I can just touch on where you see this heading, um, you know, we've seen recently, as Andrew mentioned, the right to disconnect and uh, there've also been some changes to leave entitlements. Things seem to be swinging uh, towards protecting employees more than perhaps they have in the past. But yeah, what's what's um, this panel's perspective on where we think this is going to be heading? I think it's a really interesting spot where oftentimes we see with legal changes that they bring in changes relatively quite quickly. It, for a lot of companies' perspective. They appear somewhat rushed in terms of coming in, even if that may or may not be the case. Uh, and then there's this period of time in which companies are trying to work out what it means. And then the regulators almost, it appears, it almost feels this way. The regulators kind of wake up and they get resources. And then they start actually doing inspections or start actually, um, cases actually come out. So we get this kind of jarring moment where we're like, oh, they're actually taking this part quite seriously. We are seeing penalties come through. Um, and it's all dependent on how many resources the regulators often have. So um, at the moment, um, there appears to be a shift towards what they consider the high-risk areas for psychosocial hazards, which makes sense. You kind of go after the areas that you think might be the biggest kind of perpetrators or biggest breaches. Uh, and then after that, and that will get a large amount of um, media coverage, as it should, I think we'll start seeing um, it then move on to other industries and therefore it sometimes can feel like it's a bit of a journey um, and sometimes it can feel sporadic, but I think we'll see it. The highest risk sectors with biggest employees will be arguably targeted first, and then they'll kind of flow through. And then I guess we'll see in a few years' times whether they think it has actually caused the change we needed um, or whether it's kind of lagging behind. I know in other areas like non-slavery, for example, they brought in a change, they've started kind of looking at it, and then they did a review after a few years because they found it wasn't actually having the impact they wanted. So I'm actually, it's, it's a really hard one to know. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I think we'll see different states um, review their workers' compensation scheme like Victoria is doing to try to see potentially if they can narrow some of the claims that are coming forward, um, which is arguably going the opposite direction to some more employee entitlements. Um, so, yeah, I think state governments in terms of their budgets, they'll see kind of have what impact this is having, regulators, what their funding will be. Um, ideally, in the next five to ten years, we'll see a big shift um, but it is always hard to know um, because it can get a little bit political in terms of how much time and effort we're putting into this, um, what's the flavour of the month. Uh, so, yeah, I, personally speaking, I really hope it continues and we see some really fundamental changes here. Um, but I guess you would, I think you'd be a little silly if you're making this too black and white and you're with too much certainty. But, yeah, I'd be keen to hear yeah. um, other panels. Yeah. yeah, Sarah, Shiham, are you hopeful yeah. for the future? Um, what are your thoughts? I think I'm very, yeah, we're very hopeful for the future. I think um, Andy's talked about, obviously, the changes from a federal perspective. I think at a global level, what we're going to see is um, over the next year, the European Union leading um, their architecture around psychosocial risk management. So we already know that there's an ISO 45003 um, guideline in place. Um, so if um, you haven't read that as yet, I recommend that you have a good read of the 45,003. So the expectation that's going to be placed really on those ISO enterprise level organisations down to organisations that supply into those companies is going to be pretty high as well. So from a safety perspective, um, you know, we're backing this all the way um, with those changes that we're seeing because the EU is going to release an audit framework which will then support that ISO 45003 um, and that's in review and development as we speak so it's not far away but that's been under development for the last three years. 
Great. And so, Sarah, do you think to add? From my perspective, I think talking to other GCs in the space, obviously this is here to stay. And I think as Andrew and she kind of said, it is going to evolve and grow over time. So just understanding and immersing ourselves into the detail to address it properly. I think, you know, as a GC, you're always pulled in multiple directions at once without necessarily being the expert. So this is an area that we get expert help in. Like we do reach out to our advisors on it because It is complex, it is tricky, it's subjective, it's all of those things. So to get really clear on our own guidelines and our own frameworks, um, and then of course we set them in stone and they change and evolve again, but that's the nature of the beast and that's what we do. but that this is one of those areas where absolutely, even in a space with, you know, incredibly experienced um, people team and in-house, I'm still going to go to the experts on this stuff. Yeah, wow. Um, some great insights and I can't believe it, but um, our hour is just about up. I feel like um, we've only just sort of scratched the surface of this topic, but I do want to really thank uh, Sarah and Shehan and Andrew for sharing um, all of their wisdom, their expertise, their insights. And I feel like we've kind of closed this off on a fairly positive note, which is great. Um, I certainly have some great takeaways from this. I've just been jotting down a few. I love uh, Sarah's, you know, it's the small stuff that actually matters. We can do some of the big initiatives, but that human touch um, and uh, having good relationships with our teams and the people around us is, is, is a key part of it. I also thought the idea of just this is a natural extension of the traditional OH&S point that you made. Um, Andrew and uh, Shehan, I think your um, discussion around leadership and the importance of uh, thinking about the whole person, uh, not uh, just the the narrow, more traditional view of um, how we create a great workplace and a well-functioning workplace, as well as a safe workplace, uh, really personally resonated with me. Um, So thank you so much for your generosity and spending the the last um, hour with us. In terms of um, the next steps, um, there are various ways that you can reach out to the speakers, to the Law Squared employment team if you've got more issues that you want to talk to around uh, this particular topic. And I know Andrew and Shehan are running some great training sessions uh, for people in culture management as well as boards and senior leaders on that exact leadership topic that we were just talking about. Um, So please feel free to reach out to them if you've got um, any further questions. We're certainly going to follow up uh, the questions that we've received in the chat. Um, We'll come back to you with um, answers on that with some help from uh, Lisa. Uh, So thank you so much for joining us for the last hour. Um, I think it's been uh, a fantastic topic and a really important topic that we are going to have to continue to talk about. Um, But hopefully, as the panellists said, uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. Thank you.